Yeah. Morning, everybody. Um, Gary here from the STA and uh, and Tim from Rehab My Patient. Um, this is the third in the series. Apologies, I couldn't make it on Wednesday. Um, we're going to be looking at uh, lower limb exercise prescription today. Another thing, another opportunity for you to um, add this to your CPD portfolio. So um, click the link. Um, yeah, we'll probably make the slides accessible in the CPD folder as well in the, on the resources. Um, write a review, you know, get, open a Word document, date and title it, reference Tim, and uh, write a review on the content. Let us know what you think about it. And, um, you know, we're going to be doing more of these. Um, they, they take a bit of setting up. Um, but well worth it. Um, we've got a, another free uh, license to rehab my patient to give away today. So I've already written a number in my little uh, notepad and the uh, the appropriate person that joins us at that number will, will get a free license. And I'll be emailing all three winners a little bit later today. Uh, I've got another one of these at, uh, at quarter 12 on a different platform. So uh, when I get round to it this afternoon, I will uh, let all the winners know. So over to you, Tim. Uh, thanks again, as always. Uh, always great to have uh, trusted industry, uh, respected trainers on board and and, and communicating with the STA members and providing the extra benefits so thanks mate and I'll hand over to you now. Hi guys yeah the competition so um, just to add a slight caveat if you're already a paid member we obviously we can't give you a free license but if you're if you're not a paid member then 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 you, the competition is certainly applicable if it if it does happen to pick up a paid member then we'll certainly give you I don't know if it give you something else off or yeah. give you a Three months what so. I can do is, um, if we do pick a paid member, you know, because it's it's randomly drawn, you know, it's uh, yeah. it's just a number that I thought of. Uh, hopefully, we get that number of people. Otherwise, <laughs> you know, I have to have a plan B. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, what we'll do with those winners so that they don't lose out because they have been drawn, then I will contact them um, individually and I'll sort something out with them uh, directly. So uh, yeah, we can we can help. Great stuff, Gary. Always, always supporting the STA members. It's so, so good. Uh, what a, what a great organisation, uh, STAR. Uh, it's been great to be involved with you guys, and um, I'm excited to do some training today um, and just talk about lower limb rehab. Um, my experience is actually mostly um, it is mostly spinal and, and upper limb, um, but but of course I've done all the all of lower limb in previous yesteryear i i now hand it over to a few of the guys we've got a couple of excellent knee physios where i work and so they handle a lot of the rehab for me um which is which is amazing so yeah um, and lower limb rehab i mean you know like with any rehab it uh it really is there's so much of a personal choice with how you rehabilitate it's so much of a um patient specific approach so there's no one size fits all. It's really about assessing your patient, examining your patient, working out what they need to achieve, what are their goals, what may be functionally restrictive in their body, what may be short, what may be long, what may be stiff, what may, may be hypermobile, working out what, what are you trying to achieve from doing exercises. Um, at the current time, you know, we've lost our two main tools our left hand and our right hand um and that, that's a problem for a lot of people but you know what we've got to like, make the best of a bad situation and we can do online training and you know what it's i i know probably with most of you guys 90 percent of your treatment or 95 percent of your treatments are manual therapy but there's so much you can offer you know be a, to be a listening ear to have a chat with your with your clients to to give some exercises to give some advice talk to them about their workstation setup to motivate them to coach them to set them goals you know they're probably feeling pretty isolated pretty down not having much community contact at the moment and they'll probably be really really pleased to hear from you so rehab my patient don't have to use it um there's lots of other methods of doing tele rehab um or telehealth but we've got a, a free tele rehab facility where you can do an online um, video. Um, if you didn't see it in the, uh, in the first session, we did a, a uh, on Monday, we did a live demo of how to use a video consultation. It's 
very easy to set up you know and just making contact with your your patients your clients is so useful at the moment especially when you do come to reopen which we hope won't be too far so i'm going to share my screen and then um we can go through some of the exercises and talk about some of the knee problems that you're likely to encounter we'll, we'll focus mostly on the knee but we'll cover cover a little bit of the ankle and a little bit of the hip as well but uh but knee knee tends to be the one that everyone wants to talk about so knee pains um so what, what are the most common types of knee pain well, well there's lots of different types of knee pain as you can imagine you've got your anterior knee pains which typically uh, you know come under your sort of your patellofemoral pain syndrome it's patellofemoral pain syndrome is quite a quite a, a popular word in in rehab and uh, and physio um and it's it's a bit of an umbrella term like any syndrome it's not really a true diagnosis it's it's more like a sort of an umbrella for lots of different things that can come under under patellofemoral pe pain syndrome things like patella tendinopathy so your patella tendon obviously is that inflammation or that pain under the patella um, on the patella tendon or ligamentum patelli. So under the patella where, where it joins onto the tibial tuberosity um, and you get that pain under there. Now, um, there, there's actually lots of different names for that. And um, you might have heard of it called squatter's knee or jumper's knee. So basically why well, it's called squatter's or jumper's knee, you know, when you're doing a lot of squats or, or jumping a lot, you're loading the you're loading the anterior um, part of the knee. And let's see if I've got a picture on. You're loading the anterior part of the knee right here. Here's the patella tendon, and um, and you're you're um, you're shortening the quadricep, which which puts stress through the through the front of the knee, and then you get this inflammation on the patella tendon. Um, Although there's always the debate, but is it inflamed? Isn't it inflamed? I mean, I mean, some people say it's not inflamed. Some people say it's, it's more of a degenerative process. And some people say it's an inflammatory process. But we won't go into that because actually no one can really agree. But we'll just call it inflammation for now. Um, good. So um, there's also things like bursitis. So you can get um, pre patella bursitis or there's lots of different bursts around the knee most as most common two bursts are, are the, the pre patella which is called housemaid's knee um which is where you get the inflammation across the front that's that's typically from kneeling so if you come in they've got a localized swelling it's not that common we see it sometimes gardeners can get it um people like that uh, or the mu much much more common um bursitis is actually called popliteal bursitis so that's where you tend to get this inflammation at the back of the back of the knee um, otherwise known as a baker's cyst and um, that's a very misleading term baker's cyst because it's not really a cyst and goodness knows why they called it baker i'm not sure if it was named after the guy that created it a, a dr baker i don't know but um but really it's just a it's just a pouch in the back of a knee that naturally fills up with fluid so if there's been any other knee damage typically post-surgery or post a meniscus tear you typically find you get a swelling in the back of the knee. I actually, um, one of the things I do, I'm, I'm an injection therapist and non-medical prescriber. So one of the things I do is I actually aspirate knees. Um, it can be blooming difficult to get any fluid out of sometimes, but I, um, but the popliteal bursitis, if you just, we, we actually put a needle just below the, the, the line of the knee and we come from a medial angle and we draw out this golden fluid, it's a golden sticky fluid out of the bursa and uh, it's always very rewarding when you can drain the bursa and um, and people straight away sort of get off the table and bend their knee and think it's you know it's, it's a miracle so they've released that that pressure on the back of the knee so you've got the um the, you've got the um the the bit uh the the the, the cysts the, the baker cysts and the and the and the other and the other the the, the other bursitis which which are more typically called bursitis Ah, uh, it's named after William Morant Baker, a 19th century surgeon who first described a condition. What an enlightened group we have here. Um, so we've got the tendinopathies. We've got your bursitis. Uh, we've got your osteoarthritis. Now, everyone's going to be familiar with osteoarthritis of a knee. You know, it's degenerative. It's wear and tear. It usually happens first at the patellofemoral joint uh, and then typically happens in, in, in other joints. We call them... We, we usually refer to the, the knee as in three compartments. 
So we've got the patellofemoral compartment, the medial knee and the lateral knee. And often our osteoarthritis, we tend to see one compartment getting a bit more wear, and wear than, than the other compartments. Um, and that's where the hemi knee replacements have now come come forward and seem to be quite 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 popular so rather than replacing a whole knee joint they just replace one compartment which is usually medial um femoral um so you've got the osteoarthritis and um and, and you've also got your chondromalacia patellis which uh, which come under under patellofemoral knee problem and we'll, we'll focus on that in a minute of course you've got your ligament tears now one of the big mistakes i see people making is over diagnosing ligament problems and uh, generally if you injure a ligament it's a traumatic injury you don't just get ligament pain so if you're looking at the knee and you're thinking well this could be a medial collateral ligament problem you've got to ask yourself you know has, has there been trauma you know were they on a sports field did they twist the knee did someone take them out on a rugby field you know did they get stuck badly in a divot and sprain their ankle or knee joint so you, you ask yourself has there been trauma and if it hasn't, is it likely to be a ligament problem? Well, it's very unlikely. Uh, um, for ligaments to, to damage, there, there's trauma. You know, with an ankle, you know, you roll the ankle, you sprain the ligament. You, you know, that's a that's a traumatic injury. So if they're coming in with knee pain, there's been no trauma. You've got to say to yourself, is it a ligament problem? Well, it probably isn't. There's probably something else going on. Now, next question to ask yourself, you know, what age are these people? If they're late on in life, if they're over 60s, 70s, uh, 80s, and they come in and their knee just went on them, you know, the knee just goes, or they feel sharp pain for no reason, it's usually a meniscus problem. So with meniscuses, um, meniscuses are these sort of C-shaped pads in between the, the, um, the, the sit between the femur and the tibia, and they're like shock absorbers. They, they absorb force and they, they, they act as a cushion between the knee. They allow a little bit of rotation on the knee as well. And the meniscus can get damaged. Um, so we're going to look at those in a minute. Um, so when you have a damaged meniscus, there's two types of damage to the meniscus. You've got the degenerative changes. So that's by far your most common meniscus tear. So basically, you imagine you're hammering your knees for 60, 70, 80 years. Well, of course, the, the, the tissues in the knee are going to degenerate. It's normal. Everything in the body degenerates. So tissues get thinner, they get weaker, they atrophy, muscles atrophy, uh, fibers atrophy. And this is exactly what happens to meniscus. It's a load bearing structure. So it has to take a lot of load and gradually the meniscus shrinks and becomes weaker and is more prone to tearing. It's associated with osteoarthritis and it's known as a degenerative meniscus tear. And it is extremely common. We see it lots and lots and lots and lots and lots. OK, now meniscus tears can also be traumatic. So you can also sprain. You can also injure a meniscus. And these are typically rotational injuries. So you, you, you maybe jump in basketball and you land a bit funny or you or you twist the knee or someone takes you out on a sports field and the knee gets twisted and and, and, and usually in a flex position, then then the meniscus can, can be damaged. Right. Um, and of course, if they're children and they're coming in, uh, the under 16 groups, especially sort of the ages of 13, 14, 15, um, and they have anterior knee pain or pain underneath their patella, um then then it's very likely to have something called Oshka Schlatter. And you don't obviously need to diagnose these. Um, but I think it's just worth being aware of them so that they, they, they can help you with your with your rehab. Good. Um the one thing we always are cautious about, I always say it's a red flag, is kids with knee pain. So when kids come in with pain, you always have to say, look. Is this is this a problem? Now it may not be that you see any kids because I mean there's maybe not many kids that come in for sports massage and sports therapy. I don't know, um, but you know people will people may ask you. They may say, well, look, can you just have a look at my son's knee? You know they trust your your opinion. You know I'm, I'm just going to bring in my kid. That, you know they've been getting knee pain. Can you just have a look at it? And you know you you are you have professional knowledge. You are an expert in your field, 
and you, you you probably would say yeah yeah let me just have a look at it um you know we're always concerned and cautious with children with knee pain especially if it's unrelenting if it's not aggravated by sport and exercise if it's at night if it's associated with a fever or they feel unwell these are key red flags that you want to get them seen as quickly as possible so you're getting back to their back to their doctor maybe a call and say can you just review this you know just have a look at this this knee um it's not an emergency in most cases but um but uh, but if you're not sure you know you, you you can get them to their gp pretty quickly and just get them to look at it um there are occasional incidents of children with um with, with tumors and bone cancers um we've seen two kids now come into the clinic in the last few years with with tumors fortunately um um none on the knee with, with we have had a, we have seen a, a boy with a with an, a, a bone tumor on the on the hip which was cancerous but it's always one you don't want to miss so just be aware that if they come with knee pain and it's not where the patella is not under the patella which is osgood's latter then you know you just want to get them checked from 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 a gp or or a physiotherapist or osteopath or or just upscale it okay <laughs> Good. Uh, right. So uh, anterior knee pain. So here's our, our anterior knee here. So you've got the, at the top, you've got the quadriceps tendon here. So here's the quadriceps. This big, you know, you, look, you all know what the quadriceps are. And uh, and they, they blend into the patella. And, and then you have, of course, your retinaculum around the patella. And, um, and this tends to be the majority of knee problems. So often you, you have this inflammation under the kneecap. And that's known as chondromalacia patellae, Con chondro meaning cartilage, malacia meaning to feel unwell. So chondromalacia patellae, uh, which 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 can be de degenerative and and um, and can be inflammatory. Um, and different people believe different things. Some people talk about maltracking of a patella. I'm not a big fan of patella maltracking. It's not my thing. I um I I I um I don't really um. I, I think that naturally you see the, the facets under a patella are are not even between the medial and lateral facets. There's three facets of a patella. So I do think you get a little bit of a slight lateral tracking naturally. Um, but this is where you tend to get a lot, lot of the problems around this kneecap. And, you know, they respond really, really well to certain exercises and they respond really well. It's so simple, but they respond so well to stretching of the quadriceps. You know, these people are loading the front of a knee a lot. They're squatting, they're lunging, they're doing hits, they're doing uh, basketball, they're jumping, they're, you know, they're really loading it. And and so if you can just offload the, the pressure on the knee, there's lots of ways to do that. And this is where your advice comes in. You know, if they're doing sport five times a week, why don't you just sort of have that chat to them and say, well, why don't you do some swimming for once, once or twice a week rather than hammering it on the bike for you know 150 miles a week why don't you why don't you just change to do a different exercise to give your knees a rest um why don't you the way we often rehabilitate is we often look at wh what are they doing to aggravate the problem and can we reduce the aggravation can we reduce the pressure on the area that's problematic so that might be reducing the frequency reducing the intensity uh, reducing the time that they're doing the exercise or the activity um with children we don't we, we don't want to we're not going to tell our patients stop exercising we want our patients to exercise we want our clients to be fit what we can do though is we can just reduce the frequency children we do this so when children come in typically children with knee pain with Oscar Schlatter, they um they 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 are sporting they do it every day and then they do it at the weekend so we have chat to mum say look i want to reduce it to 80 percent." so do what you're doing 80 percent of the time and take take saturday off take sunday off so you're not doing it at the weekend to let the knees rest and recover that can make a big difference um and then we look at the quadricep now you'll all be familiar with the quadricep um test so you just lie on your front you bend you bend the heel towards the butt and you see how short that short or long that quadricep is if that heel can rock quite comfortably touch the bottom then usually um their quadricep is is a, is a good length um if they're restricted which a lot of people with anterior knee pain are 
um, because they're heavily quadricep dominant. So that quad is being used a lot and the quadricep is shortened. Then we want to lengthen that quadricep. And that's where, of course, our exercises come in. Uh, anterior knee, uh, anterior cruciate ligament. Um, well, of course, these are traumatic injuries. They're oh, horrible. I, I literally, when I see one coming into the clinic, I hold my hands in my head and say, no, please, not, a, not, a, not another ACL. Um, the younger ones we do tend to operate on. The older ones we tend to rehab. That's a that's a broad a broad um, statement, but it tends to we 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 find that the younger ones do respond very well to the ACL re, re, um, surgeries. Um, the knee's never quite the same again. It, it isn't. Look, you, you're never going to be as stable as you were. The ACL is such a such an important stabilizer. Um, but you know, but many people tear the ACLs. Some sometimes they they damage them, and I. I look, you know, some sports are massively prevalent for ACL tears. I used to do a lot of work in professional skiing. Uh, in fact, I've looked after two professional skiers over the years. So um, back in 2010, I looked after um, Kwame from the Ghana ski team, um, who was a slalom and uh, giant slalom skier. And, um, and then uh, back in 2018, I looked after Peter from the Tonga team on cross-country skiing stuff. So Spent quite a lot of time around skiers and uh, ACL, ACL um, tears are massively prevalent in skiers. We see this in certain sports. Um, in a minute, we'll come on to ankles and 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 we see this in you know we see in certain sports ankle uh, ankle sprains are very common as well. Anyway, <clears throat> um, look, ACL tears, yeah, they're traumatic. Knee comes in horrible, swollen. Um, they need they usually need a surgical opinion. So we often get into a specialist. They usually have an MRI scan and then a decision is made. Do we operate or do we not operate? Well, it depends on a number of factors. Um, and that process that we we, we we call, there's a very popular term in the NHS and it's called shared decision making. That's, we share our knowledge. We speak to the patient. We don't necessarily tell them what to do, um, but we work out for their situation. We, we, we have a shared decision making process. So what's the best situation for them? And um, for us as uh, as therapists, it doesn't really matter. I mean, we can either rehab them now or rehab them after surgery. Um, but it's just about what, what what's best for them. Um, so let's look at other injuries of lower limb. Ankle sprains uh, are the only real one I'll concentrate on the, ankle, on the foot. Um, they're traumatic. People roll the ankles highly prevalent in females and very prevalent in certain sports netball is the absolute key one back in 2011 i did a little bit of work experience with the uh, super league team down in bath and my goodness i think virtually every single um player had had a traumatic ankle sprain if not on both ankles um it's so prevalent once it happens once, of course, the ankle is never quite as stable again. Um, and the there's a 75% chance of reoccurrence. Um, it's a massive problem um, in some sports, and it, it, it does cause problems throughout, throughout the rest of their days, as they're much more liable to roll the ankle and sprain it. Um, they do respond very well to rehab, and working hard on stabilizing the ankle can make a huge difference. Right, that's the boring stuff out of the way. Let's do some exercises. So um, let's look at uh, some, some some typical exercises. And I'll just get my screen up as well in a minute. And uh, let's see if I can share my screen with you. Good. Um, so prescribed exercises. Let's let's use a few examples. And I might ask uh, for it open to Gary as well to, to have one example. Someone can throw a diagnosis at us or a condition at us or a presentation and we can do a rehab program for them. Uh, let's just go to create exercise plan. Let's just have a look. So if you're not comfortable prescribing exercises, don't worry. Look, um, it's there's so many thousands of exercises around, you know, thousands and thousands, tens of thousands. Um, and I always think, first of all, let, I mean, my, my knowledge of exercises is obviously massive, massive, huge. I, I always come back to the simple exercises and 
I always say to myself, look, look, is it is it short? Let's lengthen it. If it is it weak, let's strengthen it. You know, those sort of principles. And um is it inflamed? Let's reduce the inflammation. Let's let's get people back to a normal functional state. So I like simple exercises. You know, you won't rare, often see me doing single leg jumps from a box into a Romanian deadlift with kettlebells. You know, I mean, this is crazy stuff. You see the stuff on Instagram. It's crazy. And it's it's really popular because it's because it's portrayed in social media. But you know what? The simple stuff works. And I like simple exercises. I like them because simple exercises is good for patient adherence. I know my clients will do the simple stuff much more likely than doing the complicated stuff. Um, so let's go to our knee section first and have a little look at what we've got. Um, so we've got different categories. So flexion, extension, rotation, VMO, um, stretching, strengthening, proprioception, um, and a few other little bits there. Um, Right, let's look at our typical anterior knee pain, short quadriceps. How do we stretch the quads? Well, we, we bend the knee. So let's do a knee flexion exercise. Um, bending the knee and mobilizing the knee are um, similar things. So when we mobilize the knee, we typically repeat the movement. When we stretch the knee, if we want to stretch the quad, we typically hold the stretch. Um, and this is a quadriceps which you'll all be familiar with. So it's simple, standing up, heel to bud. It's a brilliant stretch. You know, we don't do it enough. If we're quad dominant, we don't stretch it enough. Dead easy to do. If you want to bring in the hip flexor, of course, you can just extend the knee. Uh, sorry, so extend the hip. So you 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 flex the knee and extend the hip to to also stretch the rectus femoris and uh, and to just come in a little bit uh, on the on the iliopsoas. Um, you can do your kneeling, uh, kneeling lunges as well for the quadricep. If you were to, to, to move forward, you can also do a hip flexor stretch as well, but this also brings in the rectus femoris. Um, and of course you can do your, your kneeling uh, quadricep stretches. Um, and that's a, that's a bilateral quadricep stretch. Um, so just stretching the quadricep, whether it's sideline, whether it's prone, whether it's two leg, whether it's one leg, it doesn't really matter. There's lots of ways to stretch a quadricep um and these are good exercises that we can give to our patients so the first thing is 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 the quadriceps short so we do our knee, knee heel to butt test and let's see how long the quadriceps is if it's short if they're coming up short it may be one side it may be both sides let's get some quad stretching done um and if if the knee's stiff you know like let's say they've got an osteoarthritic knee um we tend to see that there's some inflammation some degenerative change they're often stiff um, as physios, we love mo we love um, measuring the angle of a knee joint. I do it so often. Um, actually, I don't see knees that often, but whenever I see a knee, I always measure the angle of a knee joint to find out how many degrees it is. You know, and a typical knee moves, I don't know, between 130 and 140 degrees of flexion. But an, an arthritic knee could be anywhere around the 90 degrees of flexion, you know, 100 degrees of flexion. So they lose a lot of flexion. And in those patients, we want to increase we want to increase their range of movement. So a knee mobilization is a great exercise. It might be lying on their front and just bending their, their knee. It might be lying on their back and just bending their knee. It might be sitting on a high chair and just swinging the knee backwards and forwards. What does it do? Well, it helps reduce inflammation. It helps mobilize a joint. It helps start activating the muscles. It's a great exercise. It's so easy to do. You can sit on a chair and swing your knee 50 100 times a day brilliant brilliant for an older person to do this and we do have our elderly section as well so um knee exercises feature largely in here just to something simple like sitting on a chair and straightening your leg that's a good strengthening exercise for the quadricep and the vmo okay lifting one knee doing circles um using a ankle cuff to provide a little bit of resistance. These are all good older people exercises that they can use um, squatting. So we, we should come onto the squat because it's very widely prescribed. We just type squat in our live search. We have lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of variations of squats from single leg squats to RDLs to ball squats to wall squats to VMO squats to, 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 to squats at pregnant 
ladies can do to um there's all sorts of squats that we can do um you, you've got pistol squats you've got um you, you've got bosu squats it's it it's there's like so they, there's probably a hundred variations of different squats you could potentially do why do you want to squat well squatting is a quite a primal movement it's kind of one of these movements that everyone needs to do well we all need to sit on a chair we all sit on a toilet we all get in and out of our car um and it's a very functional exercise you know it's normal for the body to do this so um squatting is a good exercise of course they may already be doing a lot of squatting so we may may not want to uh, we may not want to to um to recommend a squat now with any exercise there's no rules on the number of times you should do the exercise squats you know it, it might be you get in to do a squat 10 times or 15 times it really depends on what you're trying to achieve from the exercise uh if it's done as a mobilization you probably get them to do it more frequently so you, you might do a higher number of, of reps if it's done as a strengthening exercise you might get them to do it um less less frequently so you might do fewer reps maybe eight six eight ten reps um but you might get them to to, to make the squat slightly more challenging or to progress it to make it, it harder like a single leg squat rather than a double leg squat um there's no rules on how many squats you should do how many times how long you should hold a squat for how deep you should go i always judge it on what my client can achieve so i i work out where how conditioned they are and then we'll do this we do it together um and then i i start them simply and progress them if i'm not sure i'll start with a quarter squat and progress them to a half squat and then progress them to a full squat you know you, you always start smaller and progress them each week what i don't do is prescribing 15 squats on a sheet of paper and go tell them to go away and do it i start them slowly and i progress them over a period of weeks and i suggest you do the same when you prescribe exercises, give them two or three exercises to go away and do. That's it. Don't need to give them a lot. Yeah, just use it to supplement your your manual work. And then when they come back next week, review the exercises and progress them. If they've been doing well, keep progressing them. If they're doing badly, regress them, bring them back. Let's go make it more simple. If you follow those principles, and these are key principles um, of rehab, um, and they work. It's about working out what your patient or client can do so here's a squat um very good lower limb exercise um let's look at balance exercises so balances is um we have a balance category here balance is um it's just such a great exercise you know when if i prescribe single leg stands all the time why i i, I think because i've done loads of balance training i guess on myself so i'm a little bit biased towards balance training but just standing on one leg it's so good for working all the muscles and stabilization the small muscles and the big muscles and you know if you just do it yourself stand on one leg for two minutes you feel you're going to feel it you're feeling the glute and you're feeling the calf and you're feeling the quad and you're feeling it in the hamstring you're feeling it everywhere um and if you're feeling it just from standing on it well dear goodness me you know it works everything doesn't it it helps stabilize the ankle it helps stabilize the knee it helps um strengthen the leg um and there's loads of variations so you can make it fun and interesting and exciting you know of course we start off with eyes open and we can progress to eyes shut we can progress to making it more stable from more stable to less stable um we can we can um we can introduce standing on a towel for example which is less stable or standing on a floor with shoes on which is more stable um, we do shoes on shoes off we can use bosus we can use um now one thing about balance of course don't 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 risk your patient falling over and you'll you look like a muppet uh make sure they hold onto a table or a wall when they start of course i we all know that uh but 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 sometimes patients make make crazy decisions and try and do crazy things i once had a client um who decided to jump on a ball in my clinic um, back in back in the day, back in two thousand and three or four, he just saw a ball and he decided he was going to try and jump on this ball. He was a, he was a golfer, and uh, I think he might have seen a, a video of me do it. And um, and he fell flat, flat on his back, 
I, it was a real bad situation, right? Like bad. And, and I'm thinking, oh my goodness, what the hell do I do now? You know, I gave the guy like, you know, he had acute back pain and I'm thinking, oh my God, what on earth has he done? Look, I gave him a few free sessions and, 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 um, and vowed never to let anyone try and grab it. I mean, he just did it. I just couldn't even stop the guy doing it. I mean, it was crazy. Right. And, um, and uh, yeah, he, he fortunately recovered, and everything was fine, and there was no issue. But uh, but 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 sometimes patients do make crazy decisions, and um, and uh, so you've got to be quite careful with 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 with, with doing crazy exercises. Uh, good. Um, so hips as well. Um, with with hips, there's lots of things we might want to do. Um, strengthening adductors is great for the knee. And um, I just saw a comment. So I think the comment was. Uh, uh, example of uh, I can't remember I saw it now. It's hard to hard to keep 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 track of the of the adductors. But I saw someone do mention some adductors. So adductors, I mean, generally they're either stretched or strengthened. If they're too short, they're they're, they're stretched. If they're too weak, they're strengthened. Usually they're too weak. Adductors are actually quite quite small muscles. They're not big big prime movers. If you think that the actual movement of adduction is not it's not massively common you know you sit in football you might sit in rugby and a few sports but but it's 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 a much less frequently performed movement of the knee or hip joint um adduction so adductors are, are quite often stabilizers um and they're not big prime movers they're thin muscles they're quite narrow and um so there is a huge place for strengthening adductors i mean i've spent hours doing rehab on strengthening and adductors in sprinters so there were some reports coming out of uk athletics many years ago about um, weakness in the adductors and whether it has a contribution to hamstring strains so we spend a lot of time with our adductor strengthening and um we can just simply go go to our, our hip category um and we can look at um adduction uh, there's lots of ways to strengthen the adductor. I, I I love you know the simplest ones are just the, the like the ball squeezes or the magic circle squeezes. Um, and if you want to do a VMO exercise at the same time as an adductor exercise, then um, one of the best ones is just go to hip flexion. I I love this exercise. It's just so easy to do, and patients really get it. Where you just simply lift the leg and turn the foot outwards. You'll feel that right along the inside of your adductor and along the vmo uh, that's a great exercise of course if you want to stretch it well you'd probably do a hip abduction exercise so it's a hip ab abduction um, and you might do a do a, a, a adductor or hip stretch um, or a bilateral hip stretch uh, like so and these have all got videos by the way you can play the video and ah it's actually working fast today which is good sometimes when you live stream it it, it, it can take a lot of bandwidth so, so there's your adductor stretches. Um, of course, you've got your standing adductor stretches as well, um, such as here. Okay. Good. So um, hips, you know what? Hips tend to get stiff and they like, they love mobilization. You know, a hip joint, it, it, it's the ball and socket joint. It's It loves to be moved. Um, and hip flexion exercises work really, really well. Hip flexion overpressure exercises work great. Simply bending the hip towards your chest is is, is very very useful um, and um, a great way to mobilize a stiff hip especially in osteoarthritis if you're getting your osteoarthritic patients coming in and they've got stiffness in the hip you know just bend the hip towards towards the chest and, and yeah you know, it's so simple right but I just get so many of my patients doing it and so let's just throw in some hip mobilizations of course we've got hip strengthening exercises you know, here's a hip strength and exercise as well as a mobilization. It's as simple as lifting your leg up. Yeah. Hold, hold it for, for 15, 20 seconds. Hold it for 30 seconds. And you're going to feel it. You know, you, you are going to feel it, right? Let's put a VMO in there as well. Uh, these are not exciting, but they're simple and they work. Um, if you want exciting stuff, I mean, you can go to, get to some of the more exciting band stuffs and, and and um resistant stuff stuff as well if you want um but um okay uh but but let's just keep it simple for now um 
some of the most commonly prescribed exercises by by physios are the clams so uh, let's look at the clam so it's a, it's a gluteal strengthening exercise um, there's lots of progressions on a clam so you can vary them so you can start off with a, with a, a normal straightforward clam and progress to a, a heel a heel lift clam and um, progress with one leg straight clam and uh, sorry to one leg uh, bent and lifted clam um, to a band clam which is is, is very commonly prescribed uh, as well okay um, and let's just add, add a simple clam exercise. Um, let's select our patient. So let's test patient and let's call this um, hip rehab. Uh, press continue, put in your sets and reps. So let's let's repeat this uh, 15 times and do this twice a day. Um, and we might hold it for five seconds. Let's, uh, let's hold for 15 seconds and do it three, three times. Um, and do that twice a day. Let's uh, hold the um, VMO and adductor exercise for 20 seconds. Repeat twice and do this twice a day. And let's do 15 clams twice a day. Um, it's, uh, we're going to save and email that and print it. And there I've done my exercise program and we're good to go. So I'm going to throw it open. I think we've got five minutes left. I'm going to throw it open to Gary, bring him in, and see if there's any questions that we want to answer, um, and go from there. Yeah, hi, Tim. While you've been um, talking away there about the um, the software, I've been just monitoring some of the questions and just scrolling back um, to find M's question. So an example for an exercise, pain walking up the stairs with clicking. Uh, but with no other signs, e.g. downstairs is fine. I I um, responded to him with my rule of thumb, um, you know, um, that up to heaven, down to hell is something that I was taught many years ago. So when you're going upstairs, use your good leg um, because it's heaven. When you're going downstairs to hell, you use your bad leg, um, putting each leg on one step at a time. So both, both feet touch the step each time uh, before and when, uh, discomfort eases then uh, alternating and going up and down steps normally um, I also mentioned that was a really good way of of, of testing functionally uh, something that people do I don't at home because I live in a bungalow so I can't do the stepping one but um, it's useful to categorize where your patient is your client um, when they're doing something functional and getting some discomfort associated with that we don't want to be prescribing you know, possibly open chain exercises or sport specific exercises. Let's concentrate on the functional stuff uh, before we move on. Um, I also set a, a couple of questions in there um, about, uh, you know, what type of things can we uh, alter to either modify, progress or regress an exercise. Um, you were altering the um, the frequency, the number of reps, etc. Um, some really good stuff came back in about, um, you know, altering um, other things. We, we, we talked about open and closed kinetic chain. Uh, Shane Robinson, who's a runner, I'd expect no less from you, Shane, to be honest. I also run in hokers and I love them too. But yeah, Shane came up with a lot of things that we can do to um, to change um, the exercise. Rowan Channing came up with uh, add unstable surface like a BOSU ball, um, uh, add 10 second holds and pulse movement and use resistance bands were some examples. Um, and I also um, tried to stimulate a conversation about open and closed kinetic chain exercise and the appropriate uh, time within the rehab continuum when we would focus on either open or closed kinetic chain. So obviously that will st stimulate some conversation, but um, yeah, generally um, all good comments. Um, we're, um, uh, I would have liked a, f a few more questions. I think people are a little bit shy, um, but I think it's a really comprehensive look at, you know, what we see in clinic. You know, m most of my, um, presenting conditions when I was in clinical practice were lower limb or backs uh, and we've covered those this week so um, yeah has anybody got any questions for Tim um, before we move on no nothing coming through so um, you know once again Tim thank you for your expertise for demonstrating your your software package um, as I said at the start um, and I'll just reiterate for those people who joined late because Ed Clark you don't get out of bed very early it seems morning Ed um, hi Rachel hi Aaron um, you can 
use this um, this this webinar. Um, you can review it, review the content. Um, you can write a little word document about um, you know whether this is a revision of your existing knowledge, whether it's uh, you know there's, there's one or two little items, little nuggets of. Uh, uh, of Tim's expertise that you can take away and use in your clinic straight Gary, away. Re reflection is the word, right? Yeah. So what did I say? Yeah, yeah. Um, no, oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's just, uh, you know, it's like, it's just the thing is, is, is like reflecting, right? It's like yeah. saying, well, how, how am I going to use this information for my practice? And yeah. that's, that's where you can really nail this down for CPD. Uh, absolutely. And it, it's really good. You know, we, there's a lot of talk on the uh, on social media about professional barriers and boundaries and tribalism, and I I've never subscribed to that. I've never really given myself a title. I I see my role as a facilitator in in improving somebody's health or um, their condition. So um, I'm always up for being challenged myself, and you know, love him or hate him, Mr. Meekins um, always got me to challenge my own beliefs and reflect and and make sure I was doing the best for my client. Uh, and that's why it's really important that we, you know, we host these sorts of um, the, these webinars so that we can, you know, um, engage directly with the members. You know, we're not we're just a faceless entity. You know, I am responsible and, um, you know, for providing content. Excuse me, my screen's just gone dark. Uh, I am responsible for providing content and changing the, the, the way that we access CPD. And I think, you know, with this pandemic and, and i've been talking to other educators um over the past week or so i think this is going to change the, the face of cpd I, I don't think we're going to travel the length and breadth of the country to do courses and spend you know on accommodation and and such like i think there is a place for you know web-based uh, webinar content uh, that's interactive as well um so i'm just looking um a lot of thanks coming in from Facebook users, I think that's me actually, because on one screen I'm me, and on one I'm a, uh, I'm, I'm just a Facebook user. Thanks, uh, yeah, Fiona, nice to to see you here again. Um, Gemma, hi, Shane, yeah, Cara, hi, didn't see you were sneaking in there, um, but yeah, it's all good stuff. And uh, and as I say, reiterate my thanks to you. And um, I'm going to be in touch with um, somebody later on uh, with regards to the uh, free software license come on gary you gotta let us know who's won it today what number did well, you pick out a, a bit uh, a bit embarrassing really that the number that i wrote down is actually one of the um the sta staff who who helps us out so <laughs> I'm gonna, it was rachel anyway hi rachel uh, rachel does our social media marketing and and she was she joined at the number that i'd, I'd written down so uh, i'll discuss that with rachel if she hasn't got it then yes i'll um you know, I will make sure she gets it, but um, I'll also make another one available for somebody who's not involved with with the STA, um, so that uh, they don't think it's a fix. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think anyone would ever question question it, but yeah, yeah. It, that's uh, that's great. So someone else uh, will even get one as well. Yeah, absolutely, and and you know that's what the STA is here for. We're a not for profit association. You know, all 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 membership fees which are you know have been greatly reduced in the in the past couple of months but you know that is, it's just the way it is um it's used for creating member benefits we do have some small admin admin costs and you know uh, we, we're members of councils we have to pay annual fees and stuff like that but uh, but generally you know most of the money that we raise goes to exhibitions the expos that we attend um providing things like the free licenses providing um training bursaries um so yeah there's lots of things coming up uh, which we're going to be announcing um you know over the coming weeks but uh, you know just reiterating that i think this is the way forward for for, for cpd web-based learning uh, that's that's interactive as well so yeah thanks again i uh, hope you all have a uh, a wonderful rest of the the day celebrating uh, victory in europe day um I'm, I'm going back on, on to speak to a couple of people and it, in a conference call in, in about an hour's time. So I'm going to go and get my lunch because I get up really early and, and it's now lunchtime for me. But um, yeah, take care, everybody. Stay safe. Um, look out for, you know, Sunday's announcement with the prime minister and then and then, you know, give everybody a couple of days to, to come up with some policies and procedures to put in place. I don't think we're going to be going back to work as soon as other people are saying on social media. 
Um, I think we're in one of the higher risk categories. Um, and, and irrespective of your views, you know, my, my personal opinion that I've seen a lot of these uh, coronavirus prevention courses, you know, doing the rounds. And, you know, I don't think they're... Uh, I don't think it's fit for purpose in the fact that they won't prevent it. They'll minimise the the risk, but you can't mitigate the risk. So, um, you know, at the moment, don't don't spend your twenty or thirty quid doing a a, a course um, which may not be uh, be worthy until we've spoken to the insurance companies. Um, yeah, take care, Tim. Thanks again, take and uh, we'll we'll see you soon. Yeah, brilliant. Take care. Right, take care. Bye, guys. Bye, everybody. Bye.